Welcome to session five of the Real God series. I have to tell you, I am so excited to share with you on the attribute that we're gonna study. It's the wisdom of God. You know, of all the attributes that have helped me personally, the wisdom of God has taken me through the most difficult, painful challenges in my life. In fact, times when I just thought, God, where are you? What's going on? The wisdom of God, understanding this truth, begin to put things together in a way that allowed me to endure some of the most difficult, painful things ever, and then see God work in ways I could have never imagined. So get your Bible, get those workbooks, let's study together the wisdom of God. We're going to learn about the wisdom of God, and what I can tell you is this, if you would grasp what the wisdom of God is and understand how to apply it to your life, it can take the most difficult, painful, hard challenges that are why that you don't have an answer for and allow you to go through things in ways that you never dreamed possible. I will never forget the first time I experienced the wisdom of God in a way that it profoundly impacted my life and actually a perspective that's continued to that day. Uh, I was in seminary at the time. I had a deep conviction that my wife should stay home with our kids. So I worked full time, went to school full time, full load. Uh, we had two kids and then a toddler came along. I don't know how those things happened, but we had an 18 month old as well. I'm working full time, going to school full time. And so it went something like this as I got up at 4 or 4.30, went to the donut shop near our house, worked for two or three hours on Greek, got in the par car load, went, went to school. Any moment I was not in a class, I was reading or studying, got in the carpool, came back, ate, played with my kids, went to work until 11, 12 at night. And for about three, three and a half years, I got about four and a half or five hours sleep. On the side, just to keep our sanity, we, we helped with the college ministry. And the good news was it blew up. All these people started coming, but it created more demands. It was the spring, early summer of 1982, and I actually listed it. Three kids, the job I had, they went out of business, so it dried up. I had no money, there was stress in our marriage. I was discouraged, overwhelmed, no hope, no future. And I remember sitting in a class. And have you ever just been so tired and so bummed out and asking why? And I just thought, God, is, I love to coach, I love to teach. I came to this seminary to prepare for ministry. Why? I even went King James in my mind. Is this how thou treatest thy servants who obey thee? <laughs> and I remember sitting in a classroom of about 200 guys, and I went into almost a stupor. All, you know, I was just so wiped out. And, and then I felt a tap on my shoulder. And, and I, don't, I wasn't asleep, but the classroom was empty, and it was the professor, Dr. Ryrie. He looked at me and said, don't make any decisions for the next 48 hours. Go home, get some sleep, get a good meal. And I had decided I was going to quit seminary. I thought, you know, I'm not going to quit the Christian life, but I, ministry is not for me. If this is what it's like, I'm done. Some of you there right now, but maybe it's not ministry, maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's one of your kids. Maybe it's a situation that you just think, God, I just, you know, I've, I've prayed, I've gone to doctors, this health issue. And as I was obeying, you know, Dr. Rari wrote, a bi wrote the Bible, so I had to sort of listen to what he said. He did the Ryrie study Bible. And I remember driving uh, the next day and had pretty well decided I'm going to quit. And the definition of wisdom from his class came. He was a very thin man, wire rim glasses, and he would lecture like this. Didn't move much. The wisdom of God is that attribute by which God brings about the best possible ends by the best possible means for the most possible people for the longest possible time. And I remember vividly thinking, what if I believe that? What if that's really true? I, I, I don't know of any sin in my life. I, I certainly wasn't perfect, didn't have it together, but I was walking with God. It, what if that's true? And then like a lightning bolt, this came into my head. That would mean, if it's true, I'm not saying it is, hypothetically, maybe it is. But if it were true, if there was a kinder or gentler or better way for God to accomplish in my life and through my life what he wants done right now, that's what I'd be experiencing. And so apparently, if God is all wise, then the job drying up, 
the pressure, the no sleep, the three kids, the finances. I couldn't pay my rent the next month, and it was four days out. The pressure and stress in my marriage. This must be the kindest, gentlest, best way for this stage of my life, for an all-knowing, good, powerful God to do everything he wants to do in me and then through me. And in that moment, my perspective of my situation completely changed. And I leaned in. And I could speak for an hour about all the things God did to give me endurance to get through it. On the bottom of your notes, what a difference it would make in life's most difficult times if we could but believe that God is all wise. And what I want to address with you today is how in the world can we learn to rest in God's wisdom? How do you learn to trust God so it actually makes a difference in your life? Well, number one, you gotta know what God's wisdom is. If you would have asked me even five or six years as a Christian, what, what's it mean that God's all wise? I'd say, he's smart, right? I mean, he knows everything, but that's not the wisdom of God. Classic definition, German theologian Burkhoff says, it's the attribute of God where he produces the best possible results by the best possible means. Uh, Webster, in the definition of wisdom, says, it's the quality of being wise. It's the power to judge something rightly. It's the soundest course of action based on knowledge, experience, and understanding. And then there's some real insight here. The root words of the idea of someone who's wise is to see and to know. In other words, when you want wise counsel, you wanna go to someone who knows some things that you don't. You wanna go to someone that sees the big picture. Often it's someone that's been through some things, they've lived longer, they can give you a perspective that you could never get. Now think of this, God knows everything. God sees everything, the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. And so when we come to him, God, does all his acts in your life sovereignly, out of love, out of kindness, but he does them wisely. James chapter three, verse 17, gives us the characteristics of God's wisdom. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. When God gives you wisdom, when he's giving you direction, when someone gives you counsel, when you want to know what to do in this relationship, what to do about this job, the kind of wisdom God gives first, it's pure. It's going to be holy. And then it's going to be peaceful. It'll, it'll be a settled sense in your heart. It, it's gentle. It means it's willing to yield. It's, it's reasonable. It's actually often quite logical. It's full of mercy. In other words, you're not demanding your way and you're not going to say that everyone has to get paid back. It's full of mercy and it produces good fruit. It's unwavering. In other words, it's not this one day and that another day and it's without hypocrisy. In fact, the Apostle Paul when he wanted to talk about the wisdom of God after God led him to speak for 11 chapters about the gospel, the greatness of God, about the responsibility of man, the creatorship and sovereignty of God, he pauses and says, oh, the depth both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his past beyond finding out. Here's what I want you to get. The wisdom of God is a mystery. You can't, when you ask why of some things, the answer is you'll never know. How does it all fit together? You may never know. And so you have to trust God's character. It, it, life is a lot like a tapestry, and God is weaving events and people and highs and lows and difficulties, and, and things come into your life, and people sin against you, and there's betrayal, then you make a mistake. And if you ever take a tapestry and flip it over, it's just, it, look, it's ugly. It's got all these knots, right? Have you ever seen it? But when you flip it on this side, something beautiful is being made. And that's God's promise that that's what he's doing in the world, but that's what he's doing in your life. Tozer goes on to say, wisdom among other things is the ability to devise perfect ends, notice, to achieve those ends by the most perfect means. It sees the end from the beginning and there can be no need to question or conjecture. Put it another way, life's not a crapshoot, okay? Life's not random chance. There aren't just accidents. 
There's a sovereign, good, loving, kind God who is filtering all that comes into your life and he's doing not just the end, but the means are perfect for what you need. Notice Tozer's final observation. All God's acts are done in perfect wisdom. Notice the priority, first for his own glory and then for the highest good of the greatest number for the longest time. Not only could his acts not be done better, a better way to do them could not be imagined. Now, here's what I want you to get. Um, if you grasp the wisdom of God, and if you understand how to get God's wisdom, it will change how you go through life. It'll change how you look at challenges. It, it'll, it'll answer some of the whys in, in ways that, will allow you to endure and not bail out. I look at my own life and I think, what a difference it would have made if I would have quit seminary. I, I think I could have been a pretty good basketball coach. But I think a lot of people's lives would really be different, possibly, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, let alone mine. The reason I didn't bail out was that one thought. If there was a kinder, gentler, better way for God to accomplish in my life what he wanted to do, make me more like his son, and to accomplish what he wants to through my life, I would be experiencing that. So if it's very hard, it's very difficult, I don't understand it, it, it and as far as I know, I've not done anything, that this isn't some sort of discipline, then I can receive it from an all-wise God knowing it may be difficult, but he will give me grace and his purposes are gonna get fulfilled. Well, let me show you how he reveals his wisdom. Uh, first through creation, Psalm 104, great passage. It says, how many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. And it's talking about, I mean, whether it's the cosmos you know, I was reading, um, I'm writing a book right now on why I believe and in creation. And as I was doing research, Jupiter is so big, it's gravitational pull. All these asteroids and big rocks, they just get sucked in over to Jupiter instead of hitting the Earth. The moon, its gravitational pull puts the Earth at just, just an angle and tilt so that if it wasn't exactly the way it is, half of the Earth would be cold and half would be super hot. It's amazing, the wisdom of God. Or, are you ready for this? When a human being starts, one little cell, just a single cell, and in that, a, a, a computer program that's the most amazing, called DNA, and inside of that computer program, it doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles, and then at just the right time, the, the cells change and say, okay, we're gonna develop the skeletal system. Another one says we're gonna do the endocrine system. Another one says we're gonna do the uh, circulatory system. Another one says we're gonna do the nervous system. And this one little cell in about eight or nine months goes from one cell in the wisdom of God to like the picture that you'll see on the screen. That's my new grandson. I had to figure out a way to get him in. <laughs> His name is Nathan. And he came a month early. Seven pounds, 11 ounces a month early. Lord, thank you for my daughter. <laughs> but now, now ask yourself, the wisdom of God, one cell, it's a miracle. The second way God reveals his wisdom is through providence. Psalm 33, 10 says, the Lord foils the plans of nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Many of us are very concerned about the world as we should be. But if you went through all of world history, there have been windows of time that all of God's people were this close to being completely annihilated. There was a time uh, not too long ago when Nazi Germany appeared to have the world completely taken over and there was one piddly country trying to hold out with a guy named Churchill over the radio saying, never give up, never give up, never give up. And somehow the world is quite different than if the Nazis would have won. We have one little country started by a family and a guy named Abraham with outrageous promises. Nation after nation, strong nations, big nations, Persian, Babylon, Greek, Roman, Chinese. They've come, they've gone, they've come, they've gone. 
the purposes of God. He said, this nation would be at the center of the world. He said, I would draw them from the four corners of the world. In 1948, Israel becomes a nation. His purposes and his promises for that little country. Who would have dreamed, who could have dreamed 100 years ago that the Jews would actually become a nation and be the center of world history and world controversy? God's plans don't get thwarted for the world, and his plans can't be thwarted for your life, especially as you lean in and you walk in a path of wisdom. The third way, which is, I think, the most profound is through redemption. God's wisdom, his path, the mystery, the the way he goes about things. Wisdom is the skill and the knowledge to be on the same path of how God has orchestrated life to work. Listen to 1 Corinthians Chapter 2, verses 6 through 10, as I, you might put this in your notes, this is the ultimate divine spiritual judo move by God. And judo is, you know, it's like you don't combat judo. Judo is when someone throws a punch, what you do is you take their energy, you grab them, and you throw them out of their own energy. Watch this. We do, however, speak a message, notice, of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. We declare God's wisdom, notice circle this word, a mystery that's been hidden that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. However, it is written, what eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. How would you like to be a disciple like 24 or 36 hours after the crucifixion? I mean, can you imagine like Pete, James, the guys like having coffee? And I thought he was God. I thought he was the Messiah. And he raised people from the dead. He fulfilled all the promises. Dude, we're done. They're trying to kill us. We are hiding in this room for a reason. It's gone. I mean, we left our families. We left our work. We left our jobs. Everything's upside down. What were we thinking? Mystery of God. All they could see was the back of the tapestry. All they could see was knots and strings and and difficulty and this makes no sense and why God and on and on and on. And the demons were gleeful. Ha, ha, ha. We saw it. We killed him. We're rid of him. And then what happened? Three days later. Right? That's the mystery of God. Some of the things that you would say to God, take it away, take it away, take it away, take it away, are what you need most in your life to be the man or the woman or the mom or the dad or the single person that God longs for you to become. And if there was an easier way, a kinder way, or a better way to make you that man or woman, you would be experiencing that. So the difficulty and the challenge Now, by the way, if you're experiencing it because you're willfully in rebellion against God or you know you're involved in some sin, repent. You might be surprised how much better it gets. But if you're walking with God, and it's why. Redemption is this amazing picture. It's about God buying us back. It's about what could never even enter the mind or heart. And the Spirit of God has revealed it to us. And he'll later say that we actually have the mind of Christ. And he's going to teach us that we have the wisdom of God. Notice the last way is through the Son. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, It is because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us, underline this, the wisdom of God. Jesus, when you received him as your Savior, He's become for you the wisdom of God. Notice, what's that mean? That is our righteousness. You have a right standing with God. You know what's right. Our holiness, you are pure before God. Our redemption, you've been bought back. And so the spirit of the living God is inside of you. He's called the Holy Spirit. And what did the last passage say? The Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God so you can actually, because Christ lives in you, say, I want to walk on the path of wisdom. I want you to show me how to live my life according to your will. 
which is the skill or the wisdom of God. And he dwells within you, and he wants to guide you. The wisdom of God, as you could tell from the teaching, has captivated my heart. And then to think that the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5 commands us. He says, don't live a foolish life, but live wisely. Understand what the will of the Lord is. And I think the question is, how do you become wise? I mean, very specifically, if the wisdom of God is he's going to bring about the best results by the best means, the longest time, how do you actually become wise? Let me give you three very specific things to get you going. Number one, it begins with a fear of his ways. Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and his understanding and wisdom will come to you when you fear his ways. In other words, there's his path. There's a way that people do life. There's a way that the world does life. Wisdom starts with a holy reverence or fear to say, you know what, Lord? Um, wisdom begins by saying, I'm going to do relationships your way. I'm gonna do life your way. I'm gonna be a man or woman of integrity. The second is it grows by receiving God's word. God gives us wisdom through his word. Uh, David would write, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. As you take in God's word, he gives you wisdom because we have the very mind of Christ in scripture. So a regular diet of scripture for daily living. And then finally, it requires that each and every one of us ask for it. We looked at this passage where James 1 says, here's a guarantee. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach. But here's what it, the promise is. I will give you my wisdom if you sign up in advance to say, Lord, whatever you show me, that's what I'm gonna do. You know, you're gonna go through big hard times and every believer, every follower in a fallen world is gonna have difficult times. The only way for you to trust God on that outside of the tapestry when you're receiving the knots and the strings and the difficulties and the betrayals is to be rooted in the wisdom of God.